bushfires. Locusts, reminding us to act on the climate crisis. More disease, more transport disease on the larger scale and a quick pace to damage the crops and the animals. We were told that the fires were out of control if you don't leave now, so we had to evacuate. We evacuated town. We spent time in evacuation centers. And how does technology bridge the gap instead of widening it? How closing down the digital divide and the polarization in the digital world can be for good for the world and the prosperity of everybody. Tech for good is only a sentence because there's no regulations and we've seen how tech has been used for bad. And they, they named all these dangerous things like cookies and clouds. Turns out, cloud ain't too fluffy and the cookie ain't that sweet. In the case of a whole technology ecosystem, once you put one in, the switching costs become enormous. What's being done to make societies fairer and healthier? Yet half of the world today is not connected to the internet. Half of the world does not even have basic access to healthcare. We can't have a successful business for our shareholders if we don't have communities that are healthy. This year's annual meetings in Davos ended with a lot more commitments to fight inequality and climate change. Will those companies and governments be held accountable for their promises? I'm Chen Lei in Davos, Switzerland for BizTalk. Welcome to this special edition of BizTalk in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum. I'm Chen Lei. With the second hottest year on record posted in 2019, it's no wonder that protesters here are demanding people wake up and smell the bushfires. What does that have to do with the seaweed sculpture I'm standing next to? Well, it highlights some of the innovative solutions that businesses are working on to tackle climate change. Longer periods of hot and dry weather is increasing risk of wildfires around the world. In 2019, the fires consumed 2.7 million hectares of Australian land alone. And as a result, Australia's CO2 emission went up by 250 million tonnes. That's half the country's 2018 emissions. For the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, it really hit home. In my local community where I spend a lot of time when I'm in Australia is actually in the south coast of New South Wales. We were evacuated. Um, uh, we were told that the fires were out of control. If you don't leave now, um, you will... Um, we can, we're not responsible for what happens to you. But you know, my story is a little minor story along the way. But one thing that um, I kind of saw through the haze of smoke, and which continues now, is that I'm not really interested in the politics of uh, climate change and action and climate change in Australia. It's a bit like on a global basis, I'm really interested in action. So I'm actually launching with um, Dorji San, who's a guy I work very close with, Australian of Asian origin. We're, we're, we're launching a campaign which is called Greening Up Australia. We all now see, hear, feel, because the world's getting fused, you know. I was just in New Zealand. I was breathing the air of the Sydney fires, okay. It's being fused climatically. It's being fused technologically. And so um, with distance diminishing everywhere, we're all now participating in each other's problems, opportunities, um, achievements, and disasters. If climate change is the shark, then water is its teeth eating into our food systems. The more phenomenon is uh, water scarcity become more severe. Second, more disease, more uh, transport disease on the larger scale and a quicker pace to damage the crops and the animals. The third, I think, is also uh, more a negative impact on the soil. So, uh, and of course, and finally also speed up the uh, loss of uh, uh, biodiversity. The most important thing to remember is that right now, today, if, we, if there were to not be ever another additional person on the planet, we would still need about three times the fruit and vegetable production that we have today in order to deliver the world. What I found really uh, interesting in that aspect of conversations was the beginning realization of a link between the massive migration that we see 
to all parts of the world and the impacts of climate change. People searching for better land, uh, better grazing, for water sources and so on. Greta Thunberg leads a new generation of climate activists. But are radical slogans and social media buzz enough to drive meaningful change? And let's be clear, we don't need a low carbon economy. We don't need to lower emissions. Our emissions have to stop if we are to have a chance to stay below the 1.5 degree target. From a sustainability perspective, the right, the left, as well as the center have all failed. No political ideology or economic structure has been able to tackle the climate and environmental emergency and create a cohesive and sustainable world. She's a special force, super bright, passionate, um, cares about our planet for all the right reasons. She has no agenda other than having a healthy planet to live on and a just society. Uh, and she's right, with technology today, you don't have to use technology of yesterday. The only reason why you are is greed and just remaining dominant. It doesn't have to be that way. And it's brilliant that it's coming from her in that age. That means when she's 40, she's gonna be an amazing leader. And there's a lot of Gretas out there. So one thing about these social networks, they're great for getting people into the street. They're very bad, actually, for building hierarchies of leadership, base, organization that can actually translate their, um, their, what, what they're aroused about, what they're excited about, into concrete sustainable action. Well, protesting is sexy. Yes. Policy making is not. It's very, it's, it's, it's not. You know, and it's one of the things I tell young people about climate, that I have a saying about climate, and, and working on climate change, if it isn't boring, it isn't green, okay? And what I mean by that is that some of the greatest climate heroes in the world, I, I think of one Nobody guy, Noah, Noah Horowitz, you know what he did? He figured out how to reduce the amount of energy every Coke machine uh, consumes. Now to do that, you have to have the engineering knowledge of how a Coke machine works and how a utility works, incredibly boring. But if you can fuse those two together, you can actually make big change. To fight climate change technologically and behaviorally requires strong business leadership. While that makes for good PR, we ask if CEOs are really walking the talk. So last year we were talking about the Loop initiative, mm -hmm. and this year climate change is such a big topic in Davos. Yeah. Uh, and now you have this 50 litre uh, challenge. But my cameraman on the way here was saying, you know, is this greenwashing? Is this diverting media attention away from the real challenges of climate change mm. and it's making companies look good? No. Uh, business will, is the greatest, can be the greatest force for good in the future to solve these big challenging problems because business has broad reach, business has the means and the innovation capability. I think what's, what's going to happen is you're going to see year after year more and more progress because what, what we, we have some very clear goals that we're trying to accomplish. And you know, it's not us, it's just, just everybody. Ending plastic waste, ending the water crisis. What the 50 liter home does, for example, that's just innovations that's going to allow people to live and uh, on 50 liters a day versus 500 liters a day. That'll help end the water crisis. Governments need to take on a range of issues that will help not just the leading companies, but encourage and then sometimes even compel all companies to make, to make progress. Obviously the one that gets the most discussion is some way to price carbon and some way to prevent uh, a carbon leakage where, where uh, a customer who doesn't want to buy from the company that's made a big investment in carbon can go somewhere else to get a, a, a much a cheaper product uh, that has uh, less uh, positive carbon impact. So, so that's the, the, the topic that gets the most attention. I think by and large, business is probably not acting fast enough, but uh, we have made a ESG essential part of our investment strategy. Uh, I think for our fund four, in terms of overall fundraising, we have made uh, ESG standards, uh, 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 standards you know, applicable. By 
uh, based on international uh, standards, uh, and uh, you know because a lot of our LPs are international LPs, and and they certainly care very much about that, and we do as well. So uh, even among our portfolio companies, for example, uh, McDonald's, uh, we in the last couple of years we've been reducing the use of uh, uh, plastic straws. Uh, we have come up with uh, plastic covers for drinks so that uh, you don't need straws. And in terms of packaging, it's all paper now. And, and, and then on top of the, everything else, we, we, I think uh, the Chinese government has just announced that uh, by end of uh, this year, it may eliminate a lot of the, uh, the one-time use uh, 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 plastic. The Let's Talk More Action rallying call is being amplified through partnerships and alliances, so entire industries and value chains are working towards reduction of carbon footprints. We've launched a, a call to action, actually mobilised now uh, the Chambers of Commerce on a global basis, so we now have 2,200 Chambers of Commerce signed up to a, a coalition of action by Chambers. Uh, that represents almost 10, 12 million businesses. So what we're doing now is to help them actually act on that by developing tools to support it. We are not only reducing our own carbon footprint, what's much more important is that we are helping our clients reduce their carbon footprint. And the built environment is responsible for 30 to 40 percent of, of uh, of uh, different emissions, especially on, on the carbon side, and there's a huge potential to bring that down. But you would never turn a client away if they didn't have sustainable practices. We are, I mean, we have a certain set of values, how we want to approach our clients and what we are proposing to them. And at the end of the day, if a client doesn't believe in, in those type of values and doesn't share those values, there are prob probably other service providers who are better suited to help them. We recently completed uh, the financing of a, a very large solar project in, in Dubai. Two interesting things about that, one is it's enormous, uh, it will, will provide a significant portion of the electricity needs for Dubai, uh, but second is uh, that, that it's a continuously uh, operated facility, so the, 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 the solar energy is effectively stored in heat overnight so that the plant can continuously produce electricity, it becomes base load power. But most exciting is that the cost of this power is roughly the same as the cost of natural gas in a region where there's plenty of natural gas. We are now, uh, climate change is a key factor for airlines. So ANA and with other airline industry organizations, so as IATA and ICAO, so we set the target. Uh, uh, the total goal is 50% uh, uh, total emission reduction by 2050, uh, comparing with the 2003. So this is uh, not uh, easy to target, easy to achieve this goal, but it is our task to tackle with the climate change. Technology today is a great enabler. It allows us to be able to be much more connected, to understand each other better, and to get smarter together. 5G is igniting for us new use cases. AI is going to push us to be better humans. The ultimate skill that we possess in the future is love. And that sounds very like, ooh. That's a, that sounds very like hippie and stuff, right? challenges like climate change need to be addressed with the help of technology, the bigger theme now is ensuring technology helps everyone and isn't used unfairly, with regulation over artificial intelligence and better data protection. And the sheriff wouldn't arrest him because there's no like 
there's no law. It's a lawless town. And that's where we are right now in this, this data town. It's lawless. There's no regulations. Um, it's every company for themselves to get rich fast and have like mountains and mountains of cash. Meanwhile, everyone's been taken advantage of because of convenience. And we thought it was for free. And they, they named all these dangerous things like cookies and clouds. Turns out, cloud ain't too fluffy and the cookie ain't that sweet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, and that's only because there's, you know, there's no regulations on the greatest nation on earth. The main street of Davos is where you'll find the world's biggest tech company's temporary homes. In recent years, they've come under fire for not being socially responsible enough. But technology is also a collaborator in the solutions to all our global problems, from affordable health care for rural populations to farming that uses less resources but feeds more people. The digitalization of business is so pervasive that companies we used to think of as consumer goods makers are redefining their offerings and how they communicate, while governments are leveraging technology to improve public services. What that means is that we will use technology on our everyday household and personal care products to make the experiences better for consumers. That's how we'll use data. And we use data and digital technology to be able to get better and better literally every day and, um, and then come up with new technology and innovations to make people's lives better. The uh, robot, it solves a problem. Oral-B uh, has embedded all sorts of technology into our power toothbrush and then it has artificial intelligence embedded in that to help you give you signals every day to see how you're doing because most people don't know how they're doing until they have a problem exactly. or have to go, to go to the dentist. We have a philosophy where we put the patient at the center of the health continuum and we need to try to keep people healthy and if they fall sick how do you do indeed a precision diagnosis a first time right treatment and then support people to either recover to a healthy state or live with a chronic disease and for that we need very advanced technologies but also um, data science and big data can help uh, to support caregivers and also empower consumers to to better deal with their condition. Um, Philips brings these platforms for cardiovascular disease, for oncology, for respiratory disease, uh, so that we can optimize these pathways. So I'll share with you one example we're working with some of the Chinese AI companies on. There's 19 million children today that are born with eye infections and eye disease. If we are able to leverage the compute power that we have in our smartphones, with algorithms, with AI, with data, we can have early detection and we can save these children to have a brighter future. But um, let's talk about uh, something that's from ANA mm -hmm. that's actually allowing people to enjoy travel without traveling, oh. your telepresence robots. Ah. Um, you know, how does that, why is an airline company coming out with a service yeah. like that? You mean the ANA's avatar robot? Yes. I uh, ANA yeah, avatar robot. This is a typical question. You are airline. <laughs> airline want to people to, physically, uh, to travel. physically travel, but you know there is a huge amount of people living in global. But only uh, six or seven percent can use airplanes. Uh, this is it. Uh, it is a symbolic of innovation. On the downside. Technology's immense power can accelerate inequality, and the fight over tech dominance could have unexpected consequences. In the case of a whole technology ecosystem, once you put one in, the switching costs become enormous. So it's not like, you know, today you go to the supermarket, you buy one product, next week if the other one's better, you buy another. This, this will have, for many companies, billions and billions of dollars of cost. The odds of switching are low, and the complexity of running two systems, managing a global supply chain, serving customers that often work in multiple countries and have needs, I think it will be enormously costly. I think it will be a drag on global growth and it will make it a harder place. What is the ICC doing to make sure that technology works for everyone? We need to ensure that the way uh, the policy levers that develop, develop 
that support technology and actually enable technology uh, are actually uh, multi-stakeholder. Um, they're not driven just by governments or by bureaucrats, but they bring the private sector in. And frankly, we want civil society there. We actually do think the citizen, the individual, should be at the centre. The other issue is recognising that a number of uh, developing fragile states, least developed countries, uh, states in transition, even displaced persons, where there's actually business communities, frankly, or we want to help uh, create uh, opportunities for private enterprise to flourish because we want people to actually generate and create their own livelihood. They need to be supported with technology. They need to have um, digital skills. Technology is so ubiquitous, it seems we are in its constant grip. And the future, with the promise of far smarter machines, can overwhelm us. So what is the place for what makes us human in a tech to the max world? Here's what's going to happen in the future. Man will not outthink a thinking machine. But a thinking machine will not outlove a human. So we will be, and it's awesome that we are going to be pushed to love better. We're going to be pushed to be more empathetic. AI is going to push us to be better humans. Yet half of the world today is not connected to the internet. Half of the world does not even have basic access to healthcare. We can't have a successful business for our shareholders if we don't have communities that are healthy. And that is multicultural. Not on purpose. We weren't like, hey, let's get a Filipino, a Mexican, and I'll be the black guy, and let's, <laughs> let's, no, it's just that's what we, that's what we were born in. It's beautiful. Whether it's about your education, the home you live in, or the items you buy, your money has a story to tell. Because every business story is a human story. Global Business. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Under the weight of climate change and the technology revolution, social fabrics are strained and the outlook is worrying. A child in a country with higher social mobility is more likely to experience a better life than their parents. The Global Social Mobility Index 2020 finds there are only seven nations above the 82 benchmark with the right conditions to foster social mobility. Most countries underperform in four areas their wages, social protection, working conditions and lifelong learning. Poor social mobility coupled with inequality can prevent the best allocation of talent. Promoting equality, however, can unleash growth. We're celebrating 50 years of the inception of the internet, yet half of the world today is not connected to the internet. Half of the world does not even have basic access to healthcare. And we don't need that level of polarization on the digital front we're number six. In other, in talent, we're number 11 globally. Across the board, whether you're looking at the metrics and wrapping it up with women, because I believe if you want economies to grow, you can focus on youth and technology. But if you want them to grow and thrive, you have to focus on youth, women, and technology. So I'm, I'm very proud to say that more than 50% of my team are made uh, is actually uh, made of women. Uh, and uh, this is something that actually is totally in line with the demographics of the countries that you operate in. So what's important for us is to make sure that we have uh, that we give real chances and we have real gender equality. And that gender equality, of course, has to be matched 
or that has to match the gender equality of the population, of the work, sorry, of the workforce where we operate. In the US, wealth inequality is glaring. The three richest men own as much as the bottom half of all Americans. In this era of social activism, should billionaires be a dirty word? But to the masses, yeah. it still seems obscene that they have so much wealth. Yeah. Do you think that wave of anti, you know, the anti-ultra wealthy will you know, lead I'm, to something you know, big? I, what I think we should be focusing on is not having fewer billionaires, but having more billionaires. I want to create more taxpayers. I personally am much more interested in what's happening by lift, how we lift the floor than how we lower the ceiling. So uh, let, let's focus on, on normal people, you know. Um, and, uh, and what you know, we do to give them the tools to realize their full potential. That to me is what politics is about today. How do I enable more of my citizens? How does China enable more of its citizens to have the tools to realize their full potential? And central to that is the ability to be a lifelong learner. You know, stopping the global rise in inequality is also stamping out corruption. I don't, so many people don't realize that um, uh, the cost of corruption, say, in a country like Mexico, adds 20-25% to the cost of doing business for an SME and a micro SME. Uh, what it means is it's harder for them to actually make a living. Uh, it's harder for them to employ people. Uh, so, you know, dealing with corruption is really important. Dealing with illicit outflows of uh, finance from developing and emerging economies is really important. Because every dollar that goes can't be used in order to invest in public goods, universities, health system, etc. To lift the floor of the masses, China can offer lessons from its poverty alleviation efforts. My understanding is that first we need the enabling policy, which can help the farmers, help the uh, regional development, and also get all the infrastructure and, the, and technology and the, and the technical person is there. Uh, uh, second, I think the use of very important also, we need the, the uh, integrated approach for fighting against the poverty. That's, I think, from different angles, different uh, efforts, financially, technology, education, uh, transportation, of course, uh, rural development, uh, and also tax. And the third, I think, also you have to uh, invite all the private sectors to work together because private sector not only offer the money and the financial support and the investment, and also they can have the uh, improve the efficiency and the more adequate service, especially marketing. Last, also not least, also I think a strong leadership. If recent events have taught us anything, it is the price of just pursuing economic growth. Come 2021, will we have slowed the pace of climate change, repaired the social fabric, and put safeguards on technology? Each one of us can take action.